Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Living Towards an Age-Friendly World. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about four types of long-term memory. And this is an interesting topic for me because memories define who we are. They can unite us or they can divide us depending on who remembers what um, and can sometimes make for the best family conversations depending on who remembers what and how they remember it. So memory as a concept is the ability to store and retrieve information when you need it. And there's still a lot of debate among scientists about how to classify memories and whether or not memory is a, like a distinctive type of memory or if it's a stage of memory. But to keep it simple, we, we're going to go with that they are sensory, short-term, or long-term memories. And then long-term memories are further classified as either being explicit or implicit. Explicit means that these are conscious memories and implicit are unconscious memories. So the explicit long-term memories are further categorized as either being episodic or semantic. So an episodic memory is an event that happens to you and essentially makes up who you are compared to semantic memories, which are just general knowledge and information about the world. So if you can recall like a random fact for filling out a crossword puzzle. And both episodic and semantic memories are affected by neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, and today we're going to do a deeper dive into four different types of episodic memory because losing episodic memory tends to be more upsetting and distressing to the person, the family, and friends who share these memories um, when a person's living with Alzheimer's disease and it's progressing. So episodic memories are memories that are formed around a particular episode or an event in your life, and they take time to form and time for you to recall them. And But they are formed consciously and deliberately. So with this type of memory, you can often recall really vivid details, like your brain's recorded a movie, and they're particularly tied um, to your senses, your five senses, taste, touch, smell, hearing, and vision, and the emotional state that you were in when the memory was created. I've often told my friends that whatever state of mind you were in when a memory was created is the state of mind um, that you're in when you can recall uh, that type of information. So the first type is autobiographical uh, memory. And this is a, being able to recall events that happened to you that, in your life that make you who you are. So for example, a childhood birthday party, a holiday spent with your family or a trip that you went on. And you don't tend to remember the whole day, but you remember these moments. So these memories are just of a specific event that occurred at a particular time and place, and you can remember a lot of details. So another example will be something like your first day of school or the first time you um, rode a bike or drove a car. The second type of memory is emotional memory. So like autobiographical memories, emotional memories often serve as learning experiences that remind us of who we are now and who we want to be in the future. So these episodic memories are tied uh, to an emotional response that's related to the events. And these tend to be stronger and last longer than memories that aren't connected to a strong feeling. So episodic moments reflect what happened and who was there compared to emotional memories that reflect the emotional content of the situation. You know, you may have heard that Maya Angelou before has said that people don't remember what you say, but they remember how they make you feel. So our feelings and emotions are really tied, um, tied up into our memories and how we recall and reflect upon events. So the third type of memory is flashbulb memory. And these are another type of autobiographical episodic memory, but flashbulb memories are about traumatic public events. So for example, depending on how old you are, you may remember where you were and what you were doing when President Kennedy was shot or when Pearl Harbor was bombed, when O.J. Simpson's verdict was delivered on television, when the first plane hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center on 9-11. Anyone that lived through those events and is old enough um, to have memories, because you tend to not remember um, much before you're um, three years old, um, you have very vivid memories of one of these days that you've held on to um, from the very mundane of details. So it's kind of like a photographic record that all of us share around a common event which leads to the fourth type of memory, which is a collective memory. And this is a narrative that's shared by an entire generation or group. And it, it could be around a flashbulb memory or some other type of episodic memory. So for example, I can remember graduating from college and I'm sure that all 69 of the students that were in my class, we would all have the same memory of Charlie Daniels really rocking that um, commencement speech that he gave. So 
We all have collective memories of living through the pandemic. And many of these memories could also be flashbulb memories, like the day that the entire world was shut down because of COVID. But there also be individual memories about what was happening in our own lives during the pandemic. So memories are also made when different parts of our brain and send sensory information. So what we see, smell, hear, and feel, they send all this information to the hippocampus, which is a part of your brain that integrates this information and forms the new memory. And the hippocampus is responsible for helping us to, to reconstruct past memories and to construct imaginary events. So for example, the ability to see an, a map of your home and know exactly how to get from the bathroom down to your kitchen. So memory replay happens immediately after the event and when we sleep. And this replay is critical for making new memories and storing them for long-term use. So one question is, why do we remember what we do? And the current thinking is that we remember experiences that are gonna be important for our future. And this is both positive and negative experiences. And they're, either way, they're going to help us with future decision-making and our memories also create our identities. So how does Alzheimer's disease impact memory? So Alzheimer's disease impacts both short-term and long-term memory. Short-term memory goes first, but when it comes to long-term memory, problems will affect the person's semantic memory first. And these problems often begin several years before someone's ever diagnosed. So loss of semantic memory often shows up as word-finding problems or naming things. So basically you lose your nouns first. And the hippocampus um, that I talked about earlier is responsible for transitioning a short-term memory into a long-term memory. And Alzheimer's disease destroys this part of the brain and it does it slowly over time. So by destroying the hippocampus, it means that a person can't form new long-term memories. So I have several other episodes on the stages of Alzheimer's disease. It's a two-part series around um, early, moderate and advanced Alzheimer's. Four signs that it may not be safe to live alone when it may be time to take the keys and stop driving, 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's disease, and 10 tips to prevent Alzheimer's disease, which you can check out on my website um, and my YouTube channel or wherever you found this podcast episode. So thank you for joining me today and learning more about these different types of memories. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out. In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast and helps us move towards an age-friendly world. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab, and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.